Financial support for the production of Issues in Education is provided by the Florida State University License Plate. Your FSU license plate supports scholarships for students who enrich and contribute to our communities. Special programs, gift certificates, and rebates for first-time buyers online at fsu.edu slash mytag. Coming up today on Issues in Education, the arts and higher education. We talk about FSU's seven days of opening nights festival and how it can affect students. Welcome to Issues in Education. I'm Suzanne Smith, alongside my co-host, the Florida State University President, Dr. Eric Barron. In many discussions about higher education lately, you've probably heard about the push for more STEM degrees, science, technology, engineering, and math. But at FSU, there's also an ongoing effort to expand arts education as well. 2012 marks the 14th year for the annual Seven Days of Opening Nights Festival. This arts festival has grown a lot since 1999. No longer only seven days, performances start this year on February 4th and last well into the spring. Plus, the professionals invited to the festival work with the university's students all year round. We're joined today by Steve McQueen, the director for Seven Days. He's here to talk about the festival and the role it plays in education at FSU. Thank you very much for joining us today. Always a pleasure to be here. So Steve, why don't we start with the highlights for the season? Well, uh, it's tough to pick out one of your children. Uh, what I like about the festival is that it's very eclectic and wide ranging. Some highlights for me would be the uh, Alan Toussaint Trombone Shorty kind of New Orleans celebration show. That's going to be a huge fun party. And that's the night after Suzanne Farrell Ballet, one of the great dance companies in the world. Um, one of the great prima ballerinas, and that'll be fantastic as well. The opening is the Soweto Gospel Choir, a big, joyous, colorful celebration. Uh, one of the big highlights for me is the morning of the performance of the Soweto Gospel Choir. They will be doing a special show for a thousand middle school and high school choral students from all around Leon County. We'll bring them into Ruby Diamond, and they'll have their minds blown by this amazing group. How do you choose people to be part, or performers to be part of Seven Days? I don't know, it just magically happens. <laughs> That's not true, is it? Uh, the way we pick them is that uh, the mission of Seven Days is to reflect FSU's commitment to the arts. So that means that we bring in artists who uh, engage in the disciplines FSU teaches, which are visual arts, theater, dance, music, creative writing, and film. So that's the basis. We start there. I have discussions with the deans and, and faculty members about who would be the best people in those fields to bring in for performances, but could also relate to the students and do something that is uh, directly uh, informs what they're studying. So this year, for instance, we're bringing uh, Zvi Dance, a dance group in the dance department wanted to bring them in because they're at the cutting edge of, of uh, technology and performance, which is something that our department of dance, our outstanding department of dance, is very actively engaged in. Do performers ever contact you and say, hey, I've heard about this festival, can we be a part oh, of it? Oh, sure, yeah. It's, it's a two-way street all the time. Um, festival's been around for 14 years, uh, so word gets around, and uh, absolutely, people contact us, we contact them, the phone lines are busy. What requirements do you have for the performers to take part in with the, with the school and the festival? Because they have to work, they have to do other things than just perform. Well, not all of them do. Some of them just perform. Um, at least half will work with students. That's taken care of first. That's usually the first thing we do. We make sure we have the groups that will take care of the students. They're addressing needs that our faculty sees that can help students. Uh, mostly the other requirement beyond that is that they can bring some people into the house and do something uh, something artistic that will engage the audience and, and make this uh, a great place to live, you know, sort of elevate the, the cultural ante in the town. And how far in advance do you have to, to do this? Are, are, are you already thinking about next year's? Oh, yeah, I'm already thinking about years down the line. I mean, some things, it's a, it's a sliding scale. Uh, classical artists can be three years in advance. Um, and jazz and pop people can be two months in advance. I get calls now, do you, know, do you have space next month? I say no. I say no because uh -huh. I don't. But uh, well, this last February in 2011, when we did that Kronos Quartet show, that had been about six years in the making. I'd been talking to them for a long time, and it would it was a commissioning a piece. It was push and pull, and it finally happened. But that was a constant every year, readdressing it, making it happen, and then other things just fall out of the sky and and landed the schedule just perfectly. And behind the scenes, are there ever uh, arguments? Anybody oh. sitting there saying, no, not that person, this um, person, or you've made the wrong choice, or? There's push and pull, I would say. I don't know about arguments. Um, there's some push and pull. I always enjoy conversations with the faculty. Those are, are pretty friendly. You know, sometimes people have, there's only so many slots 
you know, there's only so many types of artists you can bring in. So occasionally there's a little tug of war, but it's been pretty genial so far, I'd have to you, say. You know, if there's only so many slots and it started at seven, obviously you've mm -hmm. been expanding. It's part of my secret plan, for sure. Uh, I think it was seven the first year, and I think when I counted, I actually counted eight the first year. So I don't know that it has ever actually been seven. Uh, I saw a festival in Kentucky or something calling themselves 28 Days, and I wanted to get on the phone and say, don't, don't do it. Don't commit yourself. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's been expanding uh, ever since. I think that's because the demand is there. Uh, mm -hmm. There was really a need for something like Seven Days. It was a gulf that I don't even know people realized how deep it was. And Seven Days really addressed it. And so the demand has been there for it to be um, as big as possible. Um, and I love dipping a little bit into the fall, a little bit into the spring afterwards. Well, Just uh, yeah, the, the, most of the events are in, in February, but you've actually yes. got two, uh, one in March, one in April mm -hmm. as well. Tell us about those. Well, in March, we have Bela Fleck and the Flecktones coming. Uh, it's just a good show. That's a, he's a great musician. He's actually putting out a record with our faculty member, Marcus Roberts, in a month or two. Uh, he's been in town a few times. He's just a prominent musician with a good following in town. That's just good old showbiz. And Sarah Vowell is a big public radio kind of thing. She's a humorist and a writer. <coughs> and she's part of that David Sedaris, Ira Glass crowd, which has done really well for seven days. We've had David Sedaris sell out twice, and Ira Glass sold out last year. So. We figured we'd bring her in. We also had two shows in the fall. We had uh, Monica Bill Barnes Dance and the unbelievable Zakir Hussein, just one of the, the greatest musicians in the world. And they both worked with our students. It was fantastic. When you're, oh, go ahead. That's right. I was going to say, did you pick those dates because of the performers? Or that you expanded beyond February because this was the only opportunity? Yeah, well, that, that's one reason. It varies. Again, Monica Bill Barnes, the dance company, was something Union Productions, uh, the student, um, presenting group wanted to do, and they wanted some uh, buy-in, some help with that. And I love to collaborate with on-campus groups, and working with the student presenting group was great. We've been looking for ways to team up. So we did that because that was the perfect time. Uh, Zakir Hussein was, yeah, that was just the date was there, and I had, they had a date in Opperman, and if you can bring somebody like that in, and he'll sit and talk to the ethnomusicology students, that's just a, that's a home run. Um, and the ones in April, yeah, that's when the one in April and March, that's just when they're touring. Bella Fleck, you can't ask him to stop a tour and come out and go way out of his way to do a show. You have to catch him when he's coming down south. How are ticket sales going right now? Uh, pretty good. Uh, no complaints. Are there any um, events that are already sold out, or are the ones in the spring still available? The ones in the spring are still available. Uh, let's see, we have um, the movie, Jeffrey Gilmore showing a movie that nobody's ever seen that he announces when he walks out on stage is sold out. That's sold out in a few days. That's a huge recurring thing. That, um, and all this is of the taping day, January 31st, so that right, everybody yeah, at home that's knows. Right. So there may be some other ones that are sold out. Right. Uh, and then there's the the Pebble Hill show that we do is sold out. And we have about four or five that are just primed to sell. Some back balcony seats left. Sweat of Gospel Choir, Joan Rivers, and Alan Toussaint, and the Carolina Chocolate Drops. And what happens to all of the money? Describe a little what bit about the budget. Are you self-sufficient? Are, are you always looking for that extra sponsor? Uh, yes, yes. I am self-sufficient and I'm always looking for that extra sponsor. Yeah, we are pretty much entirely self-sufficient, dependent on sponsorships and ticket sales and grants. Um, the money that we make goes to supporting the festival. It goes back into paying the performers, the catering, the production, the Ruby Diamond crew, and uh, all those things. Um, uh, it's, so it's a, it's a non-profit. As my mother says, I found the perfect field for my budget skills, the non-profit arena. Um, but it's great uh, in terms of our fiscal health. It's been a rough year, I think, for cultural institutions around Tallahassee, and I'm, I'm proud to see that Seven Days is still, you know, certainly here for another year. Going strong. <laughs> Going strong is a better way to put it than here for another yeah. year. Has the economy been the biggest challenge for you this year, or has it been something else? Um, I, has it been the biggest challenge? Uh, you know, money is just always the biggest challenge. It just uh, money and scheduling. Those are my, my concerns. I, I have the 10 days in February and just making, putting a balanced festival together and then finding the dates outside. Um, the economy, I think, is a challenge for everybody. I, I certainly don't think we're special in any way in, in seeing a little drop off uh, here and there. But I haven't found it to be too big of a challenge. I think the festival has been really embraced by the community long before I got here. It was a, an accepted part, something that needed to be supported, and they have supported it. So we're doing pretty well. You know, access to the arts by children is uh, an important theme, the, f the future ballet goers of the Great. world. Are there programs that are particularly accessible to children? Well, this year we are actually uh, instituting our big K through 12 program for the first time. Um, we're uh, 
we have several shows just for children. We have the Soweto Gospel Choir show I mentioned for about a thousand middle school and high school choral students. We have the Carolina Chocolate Drops are going to go to Rickards High School and do a performance in the auditorium there. We have the On Trio going to work with two different symphony classes at Raw Middle School. We have um, a bunch of Leon High School stu drama students going to see the Lo National Theatre of Scotland's Long Gone Lonesome at TCC just for them. And on top of that we have the Saturday Matinee of the Arts which is always uh, at Tallahassee Museum, which is a free day at the Tallahassee Museum geared for young people with uh, all types of crafts and artists going on. And then we have the Golden Dragon Acrobats, which is at least family friendly, if not just a that straight up kids show. That one looks like a lot of fun. That's going to be a lot of fun. Um, yeah, I'm looking very forward to that. Last year was the first time Seven Days was held in Ruby Diamond Concert Hall since it was refurbished. That's right. and uh, what did people think of it? What did well, it was just great. I mean, it was really festive. It was really something else. I think we did B.B. King was actually the first show for the public in there, and you could just feel how festive it was. It was just great to be there. Um, it, it's a beautiful room. It sounds great, looks great. Um, we did, it was a big party pretty much all year long, I think. And then I went to the College of Music's grand opening the next week, and that was just spectacular. And then all through the year, I think the performers were amazing. We had a few performers mention how incredible the place was. Um, Randy Newman famously walked out and looked around and said, what a dump. <laughs> he was kidding. And then he came back and said how fantastic it was. And Pat Metheny, who's uh, uh, very been around, he looked around near the end of the show and said, you guys really have something special here with this place. So I think the audience knew that, and the artists know that, and it's, uh, it's a quantum leap forward in terms of presenting the arts in town. And did it change how you did things for the season? I don't know it changed how we did things. It allowed us to do things well that we may not have been doing as well as we could have before. There's a the much bigger lobby now, too. I mean, that alone yeah, must have I been... I would say the lobby before was a disaster. It was, um, it it was an was entryway. A, it was an entryway with, with ticket windows that faced each other mm -hmm. and a narrow passage, was, so it, it was built to clog. Um, if more than 30 people came, you were going to get a clog there. So that and the backstage, which before was a little embarrassing, you know, showing Art Garfunkel to his cinder block dressing room with the, the bathroom without a door on it. It's like, oh my gosh. But now it's very lovely back there, and uh, the lobby is, is just spectacular. And everybody enjoys coming a little early and hanging out and being there. Whereas before, I think everybody waited until one minute to eight, we can charge in and break through that crowd in the lobby. So I think what it's helped us do is serve the customers and the patrons a lot better and present the artists' uh, material much better. They notice how easy it is to, you don't want them to, to, to notice the backstage or be conscious of these things. You just want to make it as easy as possible for them to get on the stage, present what they do, and the audience the same way. You want to make it as easy as they can just to get them from their car, sit there, so the artists and the audience can have a conversation. Are you using any other venues? Oh yeah. We use Opperman Music Hall. We use TCC, Turner Auditorium and Tallahassee Community College are a big sponsor. They have been from day one, so we always do something out there. Um, Tallahassee Museum, of course, and then we're going out into the schools. Um, University Center Ballroom for Jennifer Egan, Pulitzer Prize winning writer. Pebble Hill Plantation is another place we have an ongoing relationship with. That's always a fantastic afternoon. You know, you described a lot of wonderful K through 12 activities mm -hmm. where this festival isn't just something at FSU for the community, but you're out there in the schools and, and, and helping those schools really, really get, get closer contact with the arts. Absolutely. What about our own students? Oh, absolutely, I and mean, that's built in from day one. I think that's something that uh, Seven Days has really done well from the start. Um, as I said, when we're programming, a lot of it is dealing with faculty to bring in artists for the students. So yeah, uh, the students in all of our fields of the arts have time. The, the writers will talk with Jennifer Egan, who I just said won the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction last year. The dance students will dance with Suzanne Farrell and Zvi Dance, and the musicians will study with the On Trio and Jane Monheit and Christian McBride. Uh, the film students will get to study with Jeffrey Gilmore, who is the most knowledgeable programmer of independent film in the world. So it, it, it's huge. When you say study, what, what does that involve? Do, are they talking or lecturing or are they like working and showing them like do the dance folks learn actual routines? I mean, I'm... Yes. Kind of, what goes, how <laughs> it's how personal is it? Yeah. It's very personal. It's small, it's uh, small group stuff with the, um, with the graduate students. We have, uh, so there will probably be, I don't know, 30 to 40 students talking with Jennifer Regan for over two hours. Um, the dance groups tend to be about 40 dancers. They limit the size so that they can all get real impact from it and not just be a huge crowd. It's not like somebody walks out and talks to a thousand students. We're talking about small groups of uh, students studying the arts directly impacted. Uh, Jeffrey Gilmore is generally here for a few days, goes to several classes, and more than lecture, what he does is have conversations. 
um, addresses students' concerns because he's been around, he knows all this stuff. So it varies from format to format and, and it does all the things you mentioned. Um, but whichever one the faculty finds is the best way for the students to, to communicate with that artist is the way we go. And do you have a sense of how the students are, are reacting? Oh, absolutely. What, they're, what they feel about it, what mm -hmm. kind of benefits they get out of it? Oh yeah, I go to all the master classes. Those are my favorite things to go to, really, I think. Um, and they love it. I mean, every, uh, was it last year we had you know, Simona Dinnerstein, who's like the hot pianist of the moment. Her new record comes out today. And uh, she had four people come up and perform for her. And she stands right over the keyboard while they play. And then she takes it apart and kind of puts it back together for them over the course of 45 kind of excruciating minutes if you're sitting out in the audience. I don't know that I could take it. Um, but when you talk to them afterwards, the, the, the experience is so valuable to them to hear somebody of that stature with those ears actually take the time and really listen to a piece of music they're playing and take it apart and, and show, it, show them how they can make it better. Oh, they love it. The dance students especially just seem giddy to get in there every, every year. Last year was Mark Morris and they just show up bright-eyed and ready to dance. Mm -hmm. You know, They are ready to learn something and I think that's Nobody's like, oh God, I have to go dance with Mark Morris now. If you study um, in the field and you know the, and you, 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 then you know these artists, and the opportunity to study closely with them is a fabulous, fabulous opportunity. What about students who aren't in the arts or the, the, the you know, say they're majoring in business or mm -hmm. something like that? How do they benefit from this festival? Well, I think this festival is pretty much. Uh, the premier cultural event in, in the region. It's part of Tallahassee's cultural identity. And I think anybody who appreciates the arts and culture, which business students do, I'm, you know, I'm certain of it. Um, when I went to FSU, I roomed with scientists, and they were among the biggest classical music aficionados I knew. Um, so if you like in movies, who doesn't like movies? So there's all kinds of ways to come. And student ticket prices are incredibly low. I think it's $10 to everything, um, which seems like a bargain to me. But that's for the students. <laughs> for the students, every single show. So. Um, I think it's just a, uh, an opportunity to take part in what's happening culturally in this town. Anybody that appreciates any type of culture can find something to do at seven days, and I think it's part of the quality of life in the community. Is it true that students have actually gotten jobs out of some of these interactions? I think some of them have, yes. Uh, I know that uh, some, uh, the person before me, a tech director, got a job at Notre Dame running their theater. Um, it definitely increases the contacts. I know that um, in my office, my colleague each festival is a part-time College of Music student who works for seven days for that those two semesters and each of those three have gotten jobs very rapidly afterwards and they really have the experience of working at seven days it's not like you go there and file you basically run that festival with me for for eight months and so they come out very knowledgeable and they've all been able to land jobs very easily to um, learn more about the guests and artists performing seven days festival dot org mm -hmm. uh, tickets tickets dot fsu dot edu that's right and phone number six four four sixty five hundred that's all correct all right thank you very much always a pleasure thank you so much for having me we've been talking with Steve McQueen program director for the seven days of opening nights festival when we come back Dr. Barron and I will talk one-on-one -on -one about more issues in education Welcome back to Issues in Education. I'm Suzanne Smith talking with Dr. Eric Barron, the president of the Florida State University. Dr. Barron, we've been talking about seven days of opening nights. What performance are, are you looking forward to most this year? Well, you know, I have a, a little bit of a bias. I'm taking all of the circus performers to the Golden Acrobat, Golden Dragon Acrobat Act, about 180 uh, of our students. And so Molly and I are going to sit with them all and mass to enjoy the performance. So that's going to be a lot of fun, I think. And then I think the other thing is, you, you know, I sort of lean to those FSU connections. So Susan Farrell, ballet, should be great. And the PRISM concert, too, yes, with all absolutely. the different ensembles. Um, why is Seven Days so important to the university and the students? Well, you know, I, th I think you, you heard a por portion of it. Uh, uh, rather clearly. One is this is the center of the arts in education in the state of Florida, I think probably uh, over a much broader area. So this brings the arts here 
as part of um, this focus on everything from the visual arts, theater, music, motion pictures. Um, a second piece of it is this tight connection to our students and our faculty, where they really get the opportunity not just to interact with their own faculty, but these superb performers from, from across the spectrum. And I think that last part is what it, what it means for the community, both through K through 12 education and for this community to, uh, to enjoy all of these different uh, performers. It really does, it really is a part of the cultural identity of Tallahassee. There's been a lot of talk about STEM degrees and the, and the, the goal to get focused on more of those. Do you think that by, by becoming concerned about that, we're going to suffer in the arts education in order to focus on no, those degrees? No, I, I don't think so. I would certainly hope that it wouldn't. Uh, this, is the way, this is the way I look at it. We, we have a, a nation and certainly a state that's keenly interested in jobs. And not just in having our students go have jobs and to change the unemployment rate in the state of Florida, but to do the innovative activities that create new jobs, create new wealth, bring corporations to the state of Florida. And we know from 50 years of investment in research that investments in science and technology and engineering and mathematics has transformed this country. And so it's, it's time to do it ag again in a lot of ways. So here is this um, notion that we could do a lot better in STEM, and, and we can. Now, on the flip side of it is nobody has any money. The state is cutting budgets, not, not adding uh, resources. We don't want tuition to go up very quickly. So a big portion of that debate is how do you energize STEM? How do you create innovation at the same time you're cutting budgets? So some people sitting back are going to go, well, there's only one way to do that, and that is to make other areas suffer. I, I just don't believe we're going to go there. Uh, the breadth of the educational opportunities of Florida State are too important. Um, we rank highly in all of the different aspects of the arts. We're not going to give that up. And, and so I think there, there are other models for how to do this. Well, one, I think, suggestion that's been made is, is raising the cost of the STEM degrees. Is that something that you see happening? Okay, so I think people immediately hear that and they go, oh, oh no, that doesn't make any sense. You won't get more uh, students going to STEM if it costs more. But so here are your, here are your choices. Uh, if, if the state's not going to do it, uh, the only choice is to, for students to pay for what it is they're, they're, they're getting. And so should I charge everybody in order to increase our emphasis in one area? We could do that. Right now, humanities degrees subsidize STEM degrees because it's less expensive to teach in the humanities than it is with lab-intensive courses. You can imagine how expensive it is to teach chemistry when you don't want to even have very many students in a lab because of safety issues. And you, you just don't learn calculus in a classroom of, of 700. It, it doesn't work very well. So, you know, wh one notion is let's charge everybody more. And even though the humanities degree, you're paying more, you're not getting more, and we'll move it into STEM. Or the other possibility is to sit there and say, okay, these STEM degrees are likely to yield high level of successes. Let's charge what it costs us to produce them, and let's give those students more in the process. So if we've discovered that we can teach what's called studio physics hands-on with our students and they understand physics more, but it costs more to do that, should we charge just enough to make that, make it possible to teach physics in a way for people to really learn physics? And incidentally, this is not new, new territory. Other universities like University of Texas have small differences in tuition that yield, because you multiply it by three or 4,000 students, an amount of money that you can really invest back into the faculty that you need to teach the courses. 
In the recent State of the Union, President Obama said that if universities raise their tuitions, they may lose funding. Is this a concern for FSU? Um, well, it would be a concern on uh, depending on how they did it. So, you know, I understand everybody's worried about the rising costs. It's a lot to ask your public institutions. You hold the line on tuition, and by the way, we're going to take away your federal funding because outside of that, federal funding is declining. Oh, and we're going to take away your state funding, but you guys don't you don't, don't get carried away with your tuition increases. That that's kind of a um, a tough thing. But also, a lot of the increases in tuition are occurring in private schools, and they also get different types of federal funding. So if University of Miami in a single year increases their tuition in almost $2,000 and nobody says a word, but FSU increases theirs $500 and everybody goes, you know, what's going on here? You guys are getting carried away. What this means to me is don't punish people by the percentage of the tuition increase. If you're going to punish people for getting carried away, do it by the dollar amount. Because here's Florida State, really, really inexpensive. And the state cuts our budget, and we have to increase tuition 15%. That's $500. Another school out there may increase their tuition 4%, and that's more than that $500 that we just increased. And so do it by the dollar amount if you're going to do it. But I'm not sure it's a wise idea to, to punish public education for trying to recover from all the cuts in funding that we've received. The last quick question I have, and it's not a quick answer, the, the state legislature is in session right now. As we start February, how's it looking for FSU and the other Florida universities? Um, you know, it depends. Uh, the governor has said that the, the universities should be flat funded. And we've had five years of budget cuts in a row, so flat funding is, is, is not bad. No tuition increase. The legislature has increased tuition the House has suggested an 8% tuition increase, but a cut of about $130 million, which could translate to close to $30 million for us. That's, that's probably more than we can bear. And the Senate is, hasn't weighed in yet. Thank you very much, President Barron. That's our time for now. Please join us again next month for more Issues in Education. You can watch the premiere episode of Issues in Education the first Wednesday of every month at 7.30 p.m. That means you can see the next new episode on Wednesday, March 7th on WFSU TV. Join us as we discuss the latest developments in higher education happening around the state and across the country. If you have questions that you would like us to address on this program, you can email us at issues at WFSU.org. Again, that's issues at WFSU.org. If you would like to see past episodes of Issues in Education, head to the President's website at president.fsu.edu. I'm Suzanne Smith with the Florida State University President, Dr. Eric Barron, for Issues in Education. We'll see you next time. Support for the production of Issues in Education is provided by the Florida State University License Plate. Your FSU license plate supports scholarships for students who enrich and contribute to our communities. Special programs, gift certificates, and rebates for first-time buyers online at fsu.edu slash mytag.